last time I, I told you the recipe how to do that. It was proposed by Lucia a long time ago. So uh, let me refresh what we did last time. Um, the recipe is as follows. You put two hadrons in the box, finite box L. You extract the eigenenergies, those will be discrete. And then from each eigenenergy, you, you can extract the scattering amplitude at that energy or the phase shift at that energy via the Lucia relation. So from that energy, you extract, for example, this phase shift, from that energy, this phase shift, and so on and so forth. So for, for certain energies, then you get phase shift, not for all. And then from this phase shift dependence on energy, you'll be able to extract that this is the mass of the resonance where the phase shift, for example, passes 90 degrees. And this will be the width of resonance. That's the name of the goal. Now, what we were dealing last time were deriving the Lucia relation. How is the eigenenergy on the discrete lattice related to the phase shift of that energy or the scattering amplitude of that energy? And that's not trivial exercise. This is the Lucia relation. Unfortunately, last time we didn't finish this derivation. So it'll take like a bit, maybe five to 10 minutes to finish this exercise. Um, so if you were not there last time, I'll try to kind of um, inform you about things, but um, you'll have a little bit difficulties to follow. But after 10 minutes, you will have this relation and go on with it. So if you don't understand these five, 10 minutes, don't worry. Okay, so first let me again give you this relation and then let me finalize deriving it. Okay, so the idea is as follows. You, ex you have two hadrons in the box, you extract the eigenenergy. For example, your eigenenergy that you extract from the lattice um, is E. And then from this eigenenergy, you can extract um, the momentum P, which denotes the momentum of these two hadrons in the region outside the potential. So in the region outside the potential, basically energy is the sum of kinetic energy. So from yeah, this relation, you can derive this momentum P, which will be very important for all this that we discuss here. It will be important for, for throughout all uh, the lecture. So this momentum P is related to the energy like this. Um, okay, once you have this momentum, uh, actually the Lucia relation is this one. So if you have this momentum, you insert it here. This is the Lucia zeta function. And then you get the phase shift at this momentum. So this is Lucia relation that we want to derive. Um, so this is for now just a recipe. A little bit more general Lucia relation than this one is the following one, which we will also encounter. Again, you have two hadrons in the box. Um, you extract discrete eigenenergy E. And then this is one form of the Lucia relation. It's called quantization condition. So it, it says that at the eigenenergies, uh, the discrete lattice eigenenergies, and only at discrete lattice eigenenergies, this relation um, holds. Where M is your scattering amplitude at energy E that you're looking for, while this thing G is a known kinematical function that we still need to derive today. So, so let me now get back to the relation, which will take like for at least maybe five more minutes, and then we have the result, I guess, five more minutes or something. Okay, so um, I guess we finished here. Um, if there will be some questions, maybe I'll ask um, after we do some parts of the derivation. So on the lattice, we compute correlators, finite volume correlators. Um, okay, 
So basically, we argued that uh, in Minkowski's space, actually, the finite volume correlators at the eigen energy are having poles. So the correlator at the lattice eigen energy has a pole. Okay, so what we are looking for are the poles of the correlators. And we want to see how these poles of the correlators are related to the scattering amplitude. So this is finite volume correlator. It can be expressed in terms of M, which is a scattering amplitude. That's what we argued last time. And this G, which is basically a product of these two hadron propagators, um, but this line here indicates it's a finite volume correction to these two propagators. So G denotes the finite volume correction to the product of two propagators. Okay, so what we derived last time, um, basically we, we, we derived that this finite volume correlator as a function of energy can be expressed as this sum. So after you take the geometric sum, you get this expression. And so you're looking for a pole. You want to see where this has a pole in order to determine the eigen energy. And this is nothing but in proportional to one over the determinant of this. So this correlator has a pole when this quantization condition is satisfied where M is a scattering amplitude at your discrete lattice energy, and G corresponds to this, basically just a product of two propagators, um, the finite volume correction to this thing. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a first form of the quantization condition. Do you have a question on this? Of course, I'm not giving all the details that is, to be honest, you have some question. Well, at least those who were there last time. No, not for now. Okay. So, um, so you see, this this equation is satisfied only at the discrete lattice eigen energies that you measure on the lattice. And M is the scattering amplitude. So the name of the only other quantity that appears here is this product of two propagators, two, this two loop, um, I mean, product of these two propagators. So in the next two slides, we study this thing, which can be expressed in the end of the day with the Lusher zeta function, we will see. Okay, so let's see, what is this G? G is a product of two propagators for these two hadrons, H1 and H2. Okay, you see, here is one propagator. I'm taking them for, as scalars, no spin. There is the other propagator. Okay. Uh, and what? I'm doing the finite volume sum over all possible momenta in the finite box, so this is these guys. And I'm doing the integral over all uh, zeroth component of this internal momenta k. And this can now be expressed if the total momenta is, en um, is like energy and uh, spatial moment, total momentum is zero, which I will consider in this lecture for now. So total momentum of two hadrons is zero, and this can be expressed as follows. Now, you can perform this integral over a DK naught using the Cauchy theorem. You just find where are the poles of this expression and use the residuum theorem. Actually, what you need to do is basically written here. And you can easily see, okay, that this, of course, this sum remains over uh, finite volume momenta, k, okay. but that after this integration, you can express the result as follows. So where I have denoted omega one is this thing, 
and omega 2 is this thing. Okay. Now, let me re express um, this um, loop function in terms of this momenta um, p, which are very important quantity, as I said. Okay, so the momenta p are kind of the momenta in the region outside of potential. One can call them also on shell momenta because they're obtained from the energy of this interacting system just from the sum of individual energies, okay? Kinetic energies. So basically, if I express this energy in terms of this momenta, I, and uh, omega in terms of k, I can see that this loop function can be expressed as follows, where k is this momenta that we sum over and p is defined here. And this already looks a little bit like a Lusher zeta function, and we'll see that on the next slide. So we are still studying this loop function, okay? And we've seen that this loop function for two hadrons is the sum over all k, momenta k, where this k is like this, and p is like this. Now let's express this k in terms of integer times two pi over L, and let's express p in terms of dimensionless q and this factor. Basically, if you do this, you'll get this thing here, this denominator here. And you can already see so that this is related to the Lusher zeta function, which is defined here. So I'm not going to bother you too much with the details, but it's, it is already apparent from here that this two loop, uh, loop function, which is given here, uh, after massaging can be expressed as in terms of this Lusher zeta function. Okay, now what is this massaging like? Well, in, in the end of the day, this finite volume correction to the loop function um, has to be obtained as follows. It is this loop function that we so far really worked on. Okay, and then you separate the infinite volume part and finite volume correction. And only finite volume correction appears in this G. Then you expand the result in spherical harmonics. And I will not really um, kind of torture you with the whole uh, um, derivation. You can see this uh, reference, uh, Kim Sakhraida chart, which I gave you a little bit earlier, and all the derivations are done uh, by uh, Ursha Skerbich, by my PhD student in this additional material that is attached to the lectures. In the end of the day, you can see these two loop finite volume corrections to the, this two loop function looks as follows. Okay, so it contains this famous Lusher zeta function here. It contains this momentum P, and it's not particularly nice this term is not particularly nice. That's just because the symmetry of a cube is a different than a symmetry of a sphere. That's why these things appear here. Okay. Um, yes. So, um, just a cautionary remark. Okay, is there some particular question I haven't, I've, haven't um, gone through the details, but is there some question here? A uh, very quick one. Um, the time extent is supposed to be infinite here, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, here you. I'm uh, assuming infinite time extent so that uh, the time, um, finite time effects is not captured in here. So in, in practice, this is assuming that you your um, eigen energies effective eigenenergies have really long plateaus uh, before you feel the finite time uh, effects of the lattice and you don't worry about this, but in practice you need to worry. That's true, 
And I am not going to go into this detail, I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, but we can talk after lectures. I, 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 I had to deal with this, unfortunately. Uh, more questions? Time, you see, you can see, see, time is infinite like this is, uh, and you have an integral in this sense. So yes, so somehow like this. Okay, just a cautionary remark. This Lusher zeta function as it is given here, it's finite uh, for all LM except for zero, zero, which is the most important one actually. You have to, this is for the practitioners, okay? So if you use this thing um, for zero, zero, which is actually the most important case, uh, and, but this is, sorry, uh, I, I should have, you know, so this actually is a function of S. Here is a S and here is to the power of S, sorry. I, should have given this expression. So this is a function of S and here is a power of S. So this actually for S equal to one, which is the relevant case actually diverges. So what you have to do in practice, it's a cautionary remark. Actually, you have to uh, calculate the thing for S bigger than three half and then analytically continue to S equal to one. Okay, this is a remark. A numerical implementation, how this is actually calculated um, is done in this reference and actually many people uh, do, do use this implementation. Okay, but for our purpose, this is a known function. You don't have to worry. Now, okay, so let us, um, let us um, um, repeat what we said. Um, so the, the, uh, the quantization condition is as follows. Um, this is a known kinematical function and this is a scattering amplitude. Now um, we want to determine this other form of the Lusher equation that is usually used in all calculations and I have already shown you today. Okay, in terms of the zeta functions. Okay, so, so let me give a simple example so that we can really use this formula in the reminder of our lectures. Okay, so uh, maybe I'm doing that on the tablet just to make, just a little bit diversify uh, these um, things. No, sorry, um, no. sorry, I don't need this. Um, Okay, um, let me share this thing here. Um, okay. Okay, so see, this is my quantization condition. This is the, this kinematical function um, yeah, so let me derive now in three lines, the other form of a uh, more simple quantization condition. So let me assume that only one phase shift uh, is non-zero and the other phase shifts are zero for simplicity. And that is very often used in these pioneering works. Okay, so I only have a uh, phase shift L1 um, which is non-zero while other phase shifts L is not equal L1, let's put them to zero. Then, maybe a bigger pen, then this equation here is one by one. Um, uh, this uh, argument of the determinant is one by one matrix because this is determinant in space of partial waves. So basically, then it's basically just this, the scattering amplitude for this particular partial wave, and then this um, uh, loop function G for uh, these partial waves, okay? 
So you can see from this equation that um, that um, that I times sorry um, let me see so simply that um, I times G is minus M to the power of minus one. Okay, so basically you already immediately get this um, scattering amplitude in this situation. And now let, let me do it. Okay. Um, now let me calculate this G for this L1, L1. What is it? Okay, looks like a, an ugly expression. First, let me um, actually uh, concentrate what is this thing here. So I will have an integral, the omega, epsilon L1 M1, um, now epsilon L M, epsilon L1 M1, because I said we are looking for the diagonal um, element in this partial wave. Now this is non-zero only if L and M are equal to zero. Otherwise, this will be zero. And in this case, this is just simply equal to um, epsilon star zero, zero, which is one over four pi. So in this case, we see this will be simple. So out of all these terms, only zero, zero will remain. So let us do it. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, why is this central part uh, equal, uh, should be zero, zero? This Y LM. Um, yeah, I okay, I didn't argue, I mean, uh, if, I mean, particularly if these indices are the same, it turns out from the properties of these spherical harmonics that only this will survive. I can uh, reply to that. Yeah, it's because of the properties, it comes that it has to, it's delta zero, zero, it comes from these two, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I mean, Otherwise, Mitya, I can explain it in yeah. person. Yeah, yeah. This is um, from the properties of spherical harmonics. Okay, I did. I cannot go into that now, but uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so now let's calculate this G for our purpose. Gosh, this is too small also. So G is P over eight pi E, then one in our case, now, among all these terms here, I'll just take zero, zero. So it will be 16 pi squared and L is equal to zero. So it will be only P L cube. Then I'll have um, two pi over L to the power of minus two. Then since I'm saying only zero, zero contributes, that's it. And this is one over four pi. This, this thing here is one over four pi, which I said here, that's it. Okay, so, um, yeah, so this is G, this is this G here. So if I multiply actually by I, it will be easier. Let me multiply by I, so this is my left-hand side. Now I write my right-hand side. Okay, so it's minus m to the power of minus one. The m is written here. So it is um, one, I'm oh, sorry, one over eight pi e to the t to the power, uh, and then I have t to the power minus one. So it's basically just, um, P cotangent delta minus IP. So this is basically minus M to the power of minus one and this is IG. Okay, is there some questions here? No? Okay, 
Now, you can see that this term here cancels. This one and this one is exactly canceling. Of course, this is canceling here. So this is exactly canceling. And then whatever remains, you see, you can get picotangent delta in the end will be expressed in terms of this term. So if you put these things together, uh, I get this P times cotangent delta L of P is two zeta zero zero over square root of pi L. That's it. So that's this famous um, Lucier equation, which relates the eigenenergy and the phase shift. Okay, so let me wrap up with, um, so, um, uh, I share now my slides again. Okay. So basically whatever I said, it's written here, but here I'm summarizing again for you. If you didn't follow this derivation, never mind. All you need to know basically is written here again. So you have your eigen energy that you extract from the lattice. From this equation, you get the momentum. And now um, this is a relation that, um, relates this momentum with phase shift at that momentum. So the procedure is as follows. Determine eigenenergies for finite volume. Then from eigenenergies determine the momentum given this relation here. Then from this momentum determine the phase shift at this momentum. So you take this, this and determine the phase shift at this momentum via the Lucia relation, which is given here. And then if you have the phase shift at a given momentum, you, will, you have a scattering amplitude at given momentum. Then you can derive the cross sections and stuff. Now I have a question, whether you have a question. This is now time to really ask. Yes, no? maybe I have yeah. a question. Yes. So one has to do this uh, procedure for each, uh, case, so that in, in that case, we only consider the one specific L1. So uh, uh, one specific uh, uh, lattice um, um, size, you mean? Well, so we consider that delta was different from zero for just only uh, uh -huh. L. Yeah. In the case of Okay, we... yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, of course, uh, let me say as follows. Um, I will talk about a more complicated case, hopefully toward the end of the lecture, if I get there or I'll get next time to this, okay? Here, we will consider that only one phase shift, um, one partial wave contributes to a given irrep. If you are at zero total moment, it turns out that either odd partial waves contribute or, or even, and then if you, you have a partial wave L dominates partial wave one will not, sorry. Okay, let me say, I will come to this. Now for, 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 the, for most of following cases uh, that I will describe in practice, they actually are based on this assumption that only one partial wave is important, okay? Let's not make complications right now because we have not done any applications yet, okay? I will go to a more general case where several partial waves contribute. Is that fine? We, we just need to wait a little bit. Yes, thank you. Okay. But it's a very important question. And uh, actually, this complicates life a lot, unfortunately. Okay, so again, we extract eigen energies. From, from each eigen energy, we extract the phase shift to that eigen energy for this simple case when one, only one partial wave contributes, that can be done. And then you have a result. Okay, now finally, officially to lecture three. Okay, in lecture three, I will, um, but maybe I don't cover everything today. I'll cover some maybe 
actually in two weeks time then. Um, I'll briefly talk about the interpolator. I'll come really to lattice um, examples, okay? So I'll talk about the interpolators, the weak contractions, the need for all to all propagators, and the, I'll briefly mention the distillation method, and then applications to the bound states, virtual bound states and resonances. And in all cases, I have in mind basically here that in the energy region I consider only a single um, hadron channel H1, H2 is present. And actually also that only basically one partial wave is important for the most of the lecture. Okay. In, so, so yeah. You have to share the other screen, your, your lecture screen now. We see the, the notepad. The no, notepad. It, I see very well. Uh, yeah, I see two. I, I see the I uh, I also see the uh, lecture slides. The interpolators. Pedro, you're seeing something else than I others. <laughs> Maybe I stop again, and <laughs> this is interesting. Yeah. Truly. Yeah. And really, I I'm the host. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now now I can see your slides. Interpolators. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So. What interpolators one use if one studies meson, meson, um, uh, meson case, for example, right? Uh, one would use uh, Q bar Q, exa uh, for example, at point zero, okay, point source, with various structures here with, uh, um, with appropriate quantum numbers, okay. Then, um, then, of course, instead of just a point source, one can study um, such thing projected to total momentum P. That's what one typically considers for Q bar Q operators. And one usually considers several of those structures here, combinations of some covariant derivatives and gamma structures. Okay, but that's of course not enough to, to study the scattering. When to, to create meson meson systems, you better use also meson meson interpolators. And the typically, those have, those are linear combinations of basically two meson operators where each meson is projected to a given momentum. That those are the ones that work best. But those are costly, as I'll tell you. Okay, so if you project this meson to a given momentum, you see, you get the sum over all spatial points projected to this momentum. And if you uh, project this one to the momentum, you have to do this sum over all spatial points and project it to the momentum. Another case that you can use is a form of a diquark, anti diquark interpolators. And then typically, those are kind of all together projected to a given momentum, typically. But those may be costly as well. Okay, okay. You have your interpolators. You want to extract the eigen energies of a system, right? Um, now, what are the weak contractions? What's the problem? You have an interpolator which creates a system at time zero, uh, t t initial time. For example, you have a meson-meson operator, which I write here, something like this. And then, for example, at the sink, you also should have this operator, something like this. So these contractions, weak contractions, will contain propagators, for example, from this quark, from this quark to this quark. So for example, these guys. Well, the problem is that, you see, you need this propagator from all initial points to all the final points. So do you need propagators from all initial points, spatial points on the lattice? That's the problem. And then let's take an example of another contraction. If these have two uh, same flavors, then you also get these kind of contractions. You have this one propagating to this one. So basically you need, again, since you sum over all those y's, you need the propagators from all points uh, to all points. And then since you want to do the simulation for all T final, you also need it from all space, uh, from all um, 
from all uh, time slices. So this tells you basically you need all to all propagators for these kind of studies. And uh, brute force uh, would require calculations from all space time points, which would require this number of inversions, which is impossible basically. In, pre in practice, this is not feasible. So what people use is a distillation method today. Uh, I mean, there's other methods, but most widely uh, used um, method for this business is distillation method, which was invented by Pierdon and uh, in this paper, it's a beautiful paper. So if you want to understand this method, I really suggest you to read this paper. You'll be able to understand it in one day, I'm sure. But let me just give you an idea why it uh, makes these calculations still feasible. I will not go through the details, but just give you an idea. Uh, the idea is that instead of point quarks, all quarks that I've written here are replaced by smeared quarks in such a way. So the smeared quark is basically smeared around the point X and you don't, you only smear in space, not in time, of course, via this kind of operator. Um, and what are these V? These are the I, V are the eigenvectors of lattice Laplace operator. Um, and lattice Laplace operator is n by n matrix, so it has this size. So in principle, it has this number of eigenvectors, right? But what you do in this smearing, you don't sum over all, all uh, eigenvectors. If you summed over all eigenvectors, actually it turns out that this operator is identity and you'd get the point source back. I'm not proving it, but it's true. But actually you can sum over only like 100 lowest eigenvectors. Um, this is still allowed because your interpolator can be arbitrary in the simulation. So you can sum over all the uh, lowest 100 eigenvectors and you get these smeared quarks. Um, okay. So what is the, what's the advantage of this? Let me just try to explain. So if you do the, the standard brute force method, you need to do propagators from all initial points, as I said. So you need to do this many inversions, which is not feasible. But if you use this distillation method, in the end of the day, it turns out that you need only propagators from lowest eigenvectors, for example, lowest 100 eigenvectors. NV, you say it's, for example, 100. So you need only propagators from lowest 100 eigenvectors to uh, at source to, to lowest 100 eigenvectors at sink. So in this way, you need just to do three times the hundredth number of inversions instead of this, which is feasible, okay? So in practice, those propagators are calculated and stored. They're called perambulators. And actually it turns out that all V contractions can be expressed in terms of them. As long as you're happy that all quarks are smeared. Just let me say that you, you should not always smear all quarks. For example, if you're wondering about the, the currents of local operators like this one, you should not smear this quark. So ah, this, there should be no bar here. But, but if you are happy to smear all quarks, then um, you can just you, uh, express everything with these perambulators. Um, I just gave you an idea why this is feasible. But uh, if there is questions, I'm happy to answer. Questions? No? Okay. Now, let me finally uh, go to the um, examples. Uh, just before I go to the examples, a reminder how we will extract bound states, virtual bound states and resonances, because I'll give the examples for all of those. So 
um, you consider scattering of two hadrons, H1, H2, and you determine the eigenenergies, as I said. And for the moment, I'll uh, say my total momentum is zero. So the energy already indicates the center of momentum energy. Okay. And then the idea is you determine just the, the scattering amplitudes from these energies via the Lucial equation that I've given you. And there is one thing that we need to um, remember from the first lecture. From each energy, you, you can determine the momentum. And then there is two possibilities. The momentum can be imaginary part of the momentum but can be positive or negative. If it's positive, you are say you're on the Riemann sheet one. If it's negative, you're in the Riemann sheet two. Okay. Now, how you, then you have your scattering matrix as a function of energy. Now, how do you know whether you have a bound state, virtual bound state or a resonance? This is just a reminder. A bound state is a pole. Uh, in case of a bound state, you'll have a pole of a scattering amplitude um, for real energies below threshold. So for example, here on sheet one, on Riemann sheet one. Okay, green means Riemann sheet one. That's this guy. If you find a pole here, then you have a bound state at this energy. That's the mass of a bound state. Uh, for a bound, virtual bound state, you have a pole in the scattering amplitude below threshold at in Riemann sheet two for real energies. Okay, so you see if bound state or virtual bound state, you're actually at real energies. You don't have to consider any complex energies. Okay, but for resonances, it's good that once you have a scattering matrix, then you continue from real energies to complex energies, and then look if you have a pole in the complex energy plane. And if you find a pole in the second Riemann sheet away from real axis, that is a resonance pole. Um, let me remind you again that these poles affect the physical scattering on the physical axis. That is basically what we said at lecture one. Okay, now, um, now I'll give you examples of shell bound states, uh, virtual bound states and uh, resonances. So um, is there some questions? Um, sh sh should we make a break or we just continue? Maybe we can continue. As you wish, Asa. Yeah, for me, I, I can, for now, I think I can continue, but maybe in 10 minutes. Maybe. Okay, so shallow bound states. As I said, most of hadrons actually are resonances. The most famous bound state for two hadrons is deuteron, which I'll mention. It's of a proton and a neutron. It's below threshold. Um, um, there is not so many bound states, real bound states in the Masonic sector, but I give an example of one. So this is um, the scalar state, which lies 45 MeV below the, this threshold of D meson and K on. And this state was discovered experimentally. Actually, everybody was surprised it is so low. Um, it has a, uh, spin zero and isospin zero. Okay. Of course, because it's below strong decay threshold, it cannot strongly decay, but it still very much fills the threshold because it's not far below threshold. It's only 40 MeV below threshold. Um, and actually, what turns out from these lattice simulations that actually this threshold really pulls this state down to unnaturally small, uh, low mass. Anyway, let's see what lattice results say. In experiment, of course, um, only electromagnetic and strong decays are possible because uh, electromagnetic and isospin breaking uh, decays are possible. But in isospin exact limit, there is no strong decay. The simulations are in isospin exact limit. Okay. I, I, for example, I'll go through 
this example of a calculation, which was our own, it's very, by carbon, by current standards, this was a very primitive calculation, but is a first calculation of a bound state of this kind. And it's easy to understand because it's a little bit primitive. These calculations today are much more advanced and maybe more difficult to follow. Okay, so what's the idea? You take total momentum equal to zero and you take operators, quark anti quark operators for Charm Strange and meson meson operators. So if you have a total momentum zero, you project a K on to momentum, sorry, K on to momentum zero and D meson to momentum zero, or you can project K on K on to momentum one in lattice units and D meson to momentum minus one. And since you want to study the S wave, you do the sum over all six directions. Okay. Um, so these are your operators. So you really project every momentum, every uh, single hadron to a given momentum. Okay, so you, these are your operators and you want to evaluate the correlation function. The whole, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven by seven correlation matrix. So basically you need to consider this kind of the contractions. You, say you have a quark anti quark going to quark anti quark, or you have, for example, quark anti quark going to D meson K on, or you have D meson K on going to D meson K on. And this contraction has two possibilities, which we need to consider. I'm giving this example, which is simple um, in more detail, further the examples in less detail. Okay. Then, well, you compute your perambulators, you save them, this takes many months, <laughs> and then you compute the correlation function and uh, using this distillation method, and you, uh, you use then GVP method to extract the eigen energies. Um, and these eigen energies are presented, for example, here. This is a busy slide, I'll explain everything. But if you have questions, just jump in. Okay, so in the end of the day, this is a calculation just as a single volume, about three for me. And you use these seven operators and you get these three eigen energies. Okay, these are your finite, uh, these are eigen energies. Okay. Now, if you didn't use, if you just na used naively quark anti quark operators, you'll get, you'll get um, lowest eigen energy here. That's just a side remark, okay? Well, experimentally, you see that the state lies below threshold, 45 MeV below threshold. Threshold is given by this line, the meson plus K on mass, okay? So, okay, first physics problem until this was done, this meson naively always had too high mass. It was not understood why experimental mass is so much lower. So let's see if this exercise can, can give you a better determination of a meson mass. Okay. Is there some questions now? No? Okay. Now you have three eigen energies. And, and you see, the important point is that they are shifted away from non-interacting energies. In non-interacting case, what you expect, you'd get a D meson and K on at rest, so just here, and D meson and K on with back-to-back -back momentum one. So if D meson and K on did not interact, you'll get this and this. If you, since they interact, you get this. The, the, and one important point in all these calculations that you need to extract energies very accurately so that you are able actually to resolve this shifts from non-interacting energies. This is the main difficulty or usually. Here the shifts are large, but sometimes they are not large. Okay, so from all these three eigen energies, you can, in, you, you can 
you have eigen energies. I'm going through this example in all detail, not for all examples, okay? From eigen energies via this relation, you get the momenta. These are the kind of the on-shell momenta given these energies. And when you have this momenta, you can extract them here into the Lucial equation and you get phase shift at all these three momenta. So I'm plotting here the momenta. And here with red dots, no squares, I'm plotting the value of P times cotangent delta that you get from this Lucial equation. So these three points from these three energies. So this, as I said, this is a primitive simulation. Now you get much, many more points usually. Okay, now what? So you see, you don't have a, a dependence of phase shift for all uh, momenta, but just for certain momenta. And you want to see what's happening in the system. So what you do, since you're near threshold, you can expect that this phase shift near threshold will behave, uh, this combination will follow something which we derived was uh, effective range expansion that actually for s wave scattering that this will be a constant plus some p square term for near threshold, you always expect this for s wave. So constant plus, so what you do, you say, okay, um, I'm, I'm interpolating this, this quantity here you, it's really just two points. You say, okay, here I expect that this is really linear approximation of this quantity. Okay, and now after you do this in, in, interpolation of this quantity, you want to see where if there is a pole of the scattering matrix below threshold, if there is a bound state. So how do you do that? Okay, um, um, just maybe as a side remark. So you, you take these two points, you, you, you make a linear approximation. So of course you get these two values, right? So now these values are fixed. Now let's see what's the consequence of this, this, these values. Okay. Let's now see if there is a, a pole in the scattering matrix. The scattering matrix is always like this. So the pole in the scattering matrix will be at the momenta where the denominator is zero. So where E times momentum is P times cotangent delta. And B just denotes that this will happen at the position of a bound state. Okay, so at this, when this is, um, applicable. I mean, when this applies, we'll really have a pole of a scattering matrix. And, and for a bound state, we know that the momenta will be below threshold, so they will be imaginary and they will be on a first sheet, so they will be positive imaginary. So we know that the momenta will be I times something positive. So let's now insert this to, to this equation. So I get E times PB times I, and instead of this, I use this guy. So basically I'm inserting this here and I'm getting this. So it's a simple, you know, quadratic equation for the value of momenta. So in the end of the day, at this value of this momenta, this scattering matrix has a pole. Okay, so it turns out and then you can determine at which energy it happens when you know the momentum. You insert the momentum here. At this energy, the scattering matrix will have a pole. It is at this energy. Okay, so, so basically from, from this data, one extracts that this scattering matrix has a pole at this energy. So this is the mass of a bound state that is determined. Um, and experimentally, the mass of the bound state is here. 
so for example, we get uh, the on the lattice, uh, the bound state 36 and maybe below threshold in experiment is 45 and maybe below threshold. But within errors, it's fine. Um, one physical conclusion from this is you see, um, if you just use Q bar Q operators, you get the mass that is too high, then you take into account the effect of this threshold. Uh, and you see that actually the mass of the bound state due to this threshold actually is lower and comes closer to experiment. And this was the resolution of actually a long standing problem why this mass is lower than expected in quark models. Naive quark models is always too high um, because they don't take into account the effect of threshold, threshold pulling it down. Is there some question? Uh, yes. Um, so on the left picture, uh, this uh, difference between experimental and lattice thresholds is due to uh, non-physical pattern. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. the lattice. And actually, we, we have in isospin limit, we have only one threshold in experiment that is two thresholds since u quark mass and d quark mass are not the same. OK. Thank you. Um, but we are quite close to physical limit. More questions? No. Okay. Um, okay. Instead of going, uh, let me give you another way how to see this pictorially. Because in the reminder of the examples, I'll give this um, how to find the bound state just pictorially. So you have your quantity p cotangent delta from lattice, you interpolate. Some, you get something like this. So this is this red thing here. Now you want to see where it costs this i times p because that's where it, uh, the bound state will happen. i times p, if p is positive imaginary, is nothing but minus square root of minus p squared. If you're plotting this in terms of p squared. Okay, so this i times p is actually this blue thing here. When these two are the same, okay, you get a pole and you have a bound state. So basically, when this red thing crosses with the blue thing, you get the bound state at this position. So in the reminder of examples, we'll just see from those kind of graphs where is the bound state. Okay, this is just um, summary, for example, of the hadrons from this particular calculation. Uh, maybe this is not so important for us at the moment. Um, okay. So I'm giving another example of the same system, which we now studied basically thoroughly, uh, which, which gives a simulation that gives more information. Our calculation just used one volume and we only got three eigenenergies. For example, the Regensburg group uh, for example, on a higher pi on mass, which is 290, uses four volumes, okay? But doesn't use this kind of operators. Um, so they extract the eigenenergies as a function of volume, really. For several volumes, they see the energy shifts of the ground state and the first excited state with respect to non-interacting d meson count. The smaller the volume, the bigger you expect the energy shift to be. And you have to resolve those energy shifts. And the, um, this red and blue are for two different pile masses. Okay, from these energies, you, you put them into the Lucia equation, you can get the phase shift again. And this is, you see, for example, let's consider the red points on the higher pile mass, you see, you really get that the picotangent delta as a function of p squared. You have really, really nice uh, data several, uh, on for several values of p squared of this momentum. Not like in our case, we, we only have three points. Okay? Because they use several volumes. Okay? Now, where is the bound state? The bound state is where picotangent delta, so this red line crosses with the, this 
square root function, which is here um, a gray. So the bound state will happen below threshold. This is threshold at this position of the momenta. And they also get the bound state around 40 or 30 MeV below threshold, similar to our case. Okay, so some questions. I hope people are not lost by now. There was more questions on the first lecture. So I'd be good, there is some questions. People understand everything. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Okay, maybe coming back here. Um, we used here only a single volume. And you see on a single volume, you get only few energy levels. If you have a single volume, you get few energy levels. So it would be very good from a single volume to extract more energy levels that are um, giving you information on the scattering amplitude. Here we use just a system where the total momentum of the opposed hadrons is zero. What is, adva um, what is um, the name of the game and people now do it always, is that people don't simulate only total momentum zero, but also the other total momenta. This brings advantages and challenges. So I'll try to mention those now. Um, so, so the idea is that you'll be able to extract the scattering matrix at more values of energies, where energy now, from now on, will always refer to center of momentum energy. Okay. Well, if your momentum is total momentum is zero, if the two hadrons don't interact, what are the uh, energies that you have access to? Yeah. Well, the only energies you have access to are these energies uh, where a P is uh, multiple two pi over L. And these are quite separated. But if you have total momentum P, you, you have access to those energies. So here, mom uh, momentum of a hadron one is this guy, is multiple two pi over L, while the momentum of the other guy is total momentum minus the momentum of the first guy. Right, so this is the total energy of both. Now, since you're interested to which center of momentum energy this corresponds to, you get it via this relation. Um, so this is an example. You have total momentum here, and the usual total momenta that are considered is open zero, and then one, and one, one, and one, one, one. And then if you're very ambitious, you use other total momentum. As I said, they, they will give you more information on the scattering matrix. But this brings also serious challenges. Uh, let me give um, a more general view on what channel challenges uh, you, you encounter when you put, for example, a single hadron which is not dressed, but in flight, right? Okay, in continuum, if you have a single hadron in flight, well, if you do inversion, you'll get the, the hadron with momentum in the other direction. So even the inversion is not a good quantum number for such a state, even in continuum. So parity is not good quantum number if you have a system in flight. And that's probably the worst thing um, because, yeah, if parity is not good quantum number, this brings a lot of troubles. Um, okay, so on the lattice parity is not good uh, either in this case. Um, as far as the rotations and reflections, well, um, if you have a single hadron with momentum P, the transformations that leave this momentum invariant are symmetry transformations. And there is, 
they are content in this group. There are still infinitely many elements, but only around, around rotations, okay? However, on the lattice, um, what are, for example, for this momentum, what are the remaining elements that leave this momentum invariant? Turns out that only eight elements remain out of 24. Only these transformations will leave this P invariant. Um, and you have this total momentum, you're only left with four elements that symmetry transformation. So the problem is that the symmetry is very much reduced. And um, what is the, the challenge then in the end of the day is that a certain irreducible representation of these groups will get contributions from both parities, positive and negative. And that uh, several partial waves can contribute, odd and even partial waves in principle can contribute. And that comes back to the question that um, a person, somebody asked, um, well, for zero total momenta, either even or odd partial waves contribute. And for example, if you can neglect partial wave two, and if you are zero total momentum, then only partial wave one, uh, zero contributes, you're fine. In non-zero total momenta, uh, um, you will have in certain EREPs contributions from partial wave zero and one, and that is a, makes life challenging. Okay, that's just um, more general comment on, on, on what, uh, what becomes problematic. Sorry. Um, okay. Now, the Lucier equation. How do you generalize? We derive the Lucier equation for total momentum zero. Basically, the quantization condition was given here. Energy was equal to the center of mass energy, and that was our loop function. Now, the generalization to the non-zero total momentum, it's, the equation is basically the same. What are the changes? Let's see. This is the quantization condition, contains the scattering amplitude as a function of center of momentum energy, and this loop function as a function of center of momentum. And the loop function look, looks exactly the same. The, there is only minor changes. P now is the momentum in center of momentum frame. Gamma is this boost factor. Um, this looks like a small detail, but that really can ruin your, um, your um, project. Okay, here the zeta functions are a little bit modified. The zeta functions, now, um, as I will show next, they are not, uh, they are, the, this is the same, but just uh, what you sum over is different. Okay, let me give you a, um, a brief overview why this can be more challenging. And then we come back to explicit simulations. Uh, I think we are one slide away for, from coming back to the simulations. If you don't like this theoretical, um, yeah. Okay, so the Lucier zeta function and um, um, here is what you sum over. If you're a total momentum zero, what you sum over is um, over all integers, basically over all lattice points that you can see in the rest frame. And you can see that here the inversion is good quantum number of this mesh. And so the parity is conserved. If you're at total momentum not equal to zero, okay, what you have to sum over is basically over all possible momenta in the center of momentum frame of these two particles, two hadrons. Total moment, uh, 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 momenta in the center of momentum frame for these two particles are given by this relation. I will not derive this for you, but 
this is simple kinematics for the second grade uh, students who understand um, relativistic kinematics. So basically, this is the momentum in uh, center of momentum frame of these two particles. And then you get this R, which you have to sum over through this relation, okay? And A is like this. Now, let me give you an example. If you have this total momentum and two masses are the same, like pi and pi and scattering, then the mesh you have to sum over is like this. It's contracted in the y direction because you boost it. It's Lorentz contracted in y direction because you boost it in y direction. So the observer in center of momentum frame sees the Lorentz contraction of the, the mesh. That's obvious. But since the masses are equal, this term is zero. And then it turns out that basically the origin is here. So this is still invariant under inversions. So parity is still a good symmetry in this case. Only certain parity will contribute. So all, only all, odd partial waves or even partial waves. For pi pi scattering, this really simplifies things. Now, Consider total moment, same total momentum, but if the particles don't have the same mass. Now, again, your mesh that you have to sum over here, let's see what are their symmetries. Um, well, it's still Lorentz contracted in y direction, but since this is now not zero, A is not equal to one, you'll have some weird offset. So this, your origin of the mesh you have to sum over is here. So you see, now your mesh is not invariant under inversions. And unfortunately, um, parity, so both parities can contribute to given irrep turns out. Um, and even and odd partial waves can contribute to a given, um, Rep. And that I realized in 2012, I guess I was quite depressed because this is a real challenge then. But okay. Uh, some questions. Now we go back to lattice simulations. No? Okay, now let's go back to shallow bound states virtual bound state resonances. Let's see how much we cover. We still have 13, 15 minutes, I guess. Okay. Well, can help it. Uh, let's consider uh, the most famous bound state, hadronic bound state, deuteron, uh, proton nucleon channel. Um, eh, but this is a very unphysical pile mass. So it's uh, the situation but U quark mass is as heavy as S quark. So this is basically pi mass of 800 MeV or something. Okay, most of studies of this system using Lucia equation are for this heavy pi mass. Okay, so you put proton and neutron in a box. You extract the eigen energies. From those eigen energies, you extract this quantity, which is for our purpose, is p times cotangent delta. Okay, and you plot it as, uh, uh, as a function of p squared. And you see this uh, NPL QCD collaboration studied two total momenta, zero and two, and several volumes. And let me mention that two baryon states composed of only light quarks, one can get a lot of noise in the correlator. So it's very impressive that people actually were able to extract some energies and phase shifts for any kinds of this system. So, so this is a big effort, I would say. I'm, I'm showing the result, which is probably obtained after a lot of effort. Okay, so they obtained this P times cotangent delta as a function of P squared for several momenta. You see, it's rather linear. It behaves similar to um, 
effective range expansion, which is uh, which I didn't write. It's a const uh, linear behavior near threshold. Okay. So what did they do? They do some interpolation of this data, and they look where it crosses this square root function. At, at this position where there is this crossing, there is a bound state. And in this calculation, for example, they get that the bound state is 28 MeV below threshold. Um, while um, in you know in experiment it's two MeV below threshold. Well, let me emphasize actually that I'm just giving you one example, and that um, and that um, actually. It's not even settled within the lattice community using this approach, whether for these heavy masses, you have a bound state or you don't have a bound state. Several cal groups, Calcus, Demines group, Calat, and uh, this, there is many papers. There is, no, there is not a real consensus whether you have a bound state or not for, for these heavy fine masses. I would say so. So I'm giving you this as an example more than as a final result. Okay. More some question? No. Okay. I gave you an, two examples of bound states. Um, let me mention that state, bound states that are far below threshold, you can do in traditional way. They don't feel the effect of threshold, but those that are clear, near thresholds, and most of the exotic states are near threshold, then you have to do this procedure. Okay, now let's go to virtual bound states. Let me remind you, for virtual bound states, you have a pole in the scattering matrix on re, for real energies um, below threshold, but on sheet two. This means that momenta will be negative imaginary. These are actually not proper uh, normalizable states. Uh, and they're basically features in the interaction more. But let's see if such states exist or if they were found on the lattice. OK, since we, uh, we looked into two baryon channel, let's look into two baryon channel. Let's look in the channel of two neutrons. Again, a very phys heavy physical pile mass. Uh, this is a uh, um, recent study um, by, by actually a large group of people. Okay, so what they do, they use, uh, um, you know, several total momenta you can see total momenta, you can see several total momenta. They extract eigen energies from their eigen energies. They extract the, this quantity. And this is the lattice data. So you see that actually this quantity really is kind of linear, um, nearly linear, um, yeah. But near threshold, there is no crossing with this this thing here. Uh, if there was a crossing with this thing here, in this region near threshold, we would have a bound state. But we have a crossing with this guy. So let's see. I'm claiming that this crossing indicates that here is uh, this momentum. There is a virtual bound state. So let's see. Let's see again. So basically, um, but okay, I don't have to go to the equations. Let's see. P cotangent delta is this purple line, while green line, I'm claiming it's IP. IP, if you have a virtual bound state, P will be negative imaginary. So if you multiply these together, now I times minus I will be positive, and then P is minus. So basically it's plus square root of minus P. So, so I'm plotting this one here. So you see that P cotangent delta and IP cross, but for negative imaginary momentum. 
So this means it's on a Riemann sheet two. Bound state on a Riemann sheet two, so it's a virtual bound state. Okay. Um, they don't, I have not found in the paper at which energy this happens, but in experiment uh, in this channel, the bound state happens 60 kV below threshold. So just below threshold, there is this pole uh, of a di-neutron channel. And again, here is even more discrepancy between lattice groups, whether there is this uh, bound state, virtual bound state. Uh, so this is not resolved yet. Questions? No. Okay. Um, let me give a last example of virtual bound state, and then I guess I'll come to resonances next time. Um, this, ah, yeah, okay. This is um, this channel. D meson chaos scattering, but in a different channel that I was giving before. It's, you see, D minus is charm bar anti D, Q, K plus is U S bar. Let me actually mention that in exactly this channel, um, LHCB observed a very interesting exotic state higher up, not near threshold. And I'll give you experimental result. Um, but the lattice calculations have not reached that energy yet. But this seems to be a very interesting channel. So let's see. Uh, a lattice calculation by hadron spectrum collaboration, which, extra, which actually found a virtual bound state in this channel. It's an explicitly exotic channel. You see, it's four different quarks. It cannot be conventional channel. It has four different quarks. Okay. So hadron spectrum collaboration is known to do a very impressive studies of, um, of scattering. So for example, uh, this is their eigen energies they extract for various total momenta. This is total momentum zero, total momentum one, two, three. Um, and then they use, usually use several volumes like you, you have uh, size 20, size 24, and they, they, they determine the energies in several irreducible representations, which have some weird names, you, you never mind. So uh, this is the, re the resulting spectrum. Let me know that, for example, if the, these D meson and K on D non-interact, their energy would be given by the red line. So you see that there is shifts from the non-interacting energies, although not very large ones. But the name of the game in this whole business to be able to extract the energy so precisely to resolve these energy shifts with respect to non-interacting, okay? So, ah, maybe I should mention here this thing. For example, take this EREP, which has total momentum non-zero. And since the masses of k on and d meson are not the same, in this particular rep, you'll get contributions from S wave and from P wave, I guess. I mean, in most of these e reps, unfortunately, you'll get contributions from partial waves, uh, odd and even partial waves. So this makes problem really challenging. Okay, but I will present you the result for S wave. Okay, so in the end of the day, the, the, the collaboration extracted that this quantity, which is P times cotangent delta for S wave, L equal to zero, as a function of K square again, like we always show, um, is given by these data points. Since they extracted many energy levels, they have many data points. And you see, it's approximately linear near threshold. And we are interested near threshold. Okay, so this is P times cotangent delta. Now it crosses this thing here. So you can see that there is a crossing. 
not very well determined at what point it turn uh, it happens you see but there is this crossing so there is a virtual bound state here like i explained before of course since there is no data points exactly here it's very difficult to determine because this phase shift has to be extrapolated at which point there is this crossing but there is a crossing it seems okay so Hadron spectrum collaboration finds a virtual bound, an indication for virtual bound state in this interesting channel, for example. So let us uh, give, uh, let me give you the final result of this calculation. Um, let me consider just their lower pile mass, which has threshold here. For the lower pile mass, they find that the pole of a scattering matrix happens at these energies, very low, actually 2.1 GV, that's very low actually, far below threshold. Um, yeah. So they find this virtual bound state. So this is an example of a virtual bound state. Now, before I finish, of course, let me give you a very interesting experimental result for this channel. Um, so that happened when September, maybe let me point out that LHCB is giving us magnificent exotic results almost every month. And this is one example. Okay, so they consider, they looked at the invariant mass of this D minus K plus. So that's this combination. And then you see, they see peaks in this exotic channel. The papers are here. So they see two peaks and they, the, the way to explain them, they say, okay, there is some resonances in this channel. So they find two resonances, one with spin zero at 2.9 GV and one with spin one at 2.9 GV. Um, by the way, they are both near this threshold. Um, let me just say that just from this, they cannot tell whether this is isospin zero or isospin one state. Experimentally, it's not known whether these two states have isospin zero or one. But the Hadron spectrum collaboration before, I was showing you a result for isospin zero, for example. Okay, so of course it would be very interesting to study the scattering of this D meson K on at these energies on the lattice, 2.9 GV. Well, threshold is here, so this is far above threshold. So let's see if Hadron Spectrum did that with all their advanced technology. Let's see, right? You see their energies go to 2.8 GV. So they, and the, the life becomes quite complicated up here because there is several thresholds below. So unfortunately, it's not probably an easy exercise to do to say what really, um, to study this energy region near 2.9 GV. So the lattice calculation didn't, didn't consider this energy region, but maybe in the future. So, so this was an example of a virtual bound state from, from the lattice. Um, yeah, okay. So, Obviously, I, my time is basically over and I didn't get to resonances, but fortunately we have another lecture. And I think we have enough time to cover resonances that dedicate only to one channel and also resonances that dedicate to, for example, two channels. So in case of one channel, uh, resonances that dedicate to one channel, one considers one channel scattering that we talked about for resonances that they, they have the two decay modes, then one has to do couple channel scattering. And I will consider that next time. Um, yeah, maybe I, I don't consider all what I promised, but um, yeah. So um, is there questions? Yes. Yes. Going please. back. Uh, going back to shallow bound states, you mentioned that traditional methods that try to calculate the poles there uh, get answers that are too high because they sort of miss a threshold effect. 
I ah, didn't yeah, yeah. quite get why that is. What are they not including that needs to be included? Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, this one, good. You see, okay, suppose I use this quark anti quark operator, which we did, and you get this one state. Okay, they don't use the meson kaon operator, or we didn't do it here, and non calculation did it before us. You get this energy. It's it's um, it is um, um, actually consistent with the threshold. So can you even claim you, you observe a state? Right, what you observe here could just even be a, a D meson and a K on at rest. You cannot claim from this calculation that basically what you observe is a bound state or some, yeah, because you see, if you measure something which is kind of near threshold, you can say, okay, maybe I observed a D meson and a K on at rest. My operator can mix with, uh, can, can, can couple to this. So just from this, you cannot say even um, I'm observing a scalar meson. Okay, naively, if you think this is not coupling to D meson K on, then you say, okay, this is my mess. You were wondering probably why this this um, this operator alone. Actually, we used four probably we, here. The analyzed four by four matrix and got this ground state. Why this ground state is not here, right? That was probably your question. Yes. <laughs> See, and that it, it it turns out so. Although in principle you would say that um, this should, uh, this still couples to the proper ground state, so it should be here. In practice, if you have finite time extent, it will not get to the right position typically, okay. Okay, maybe if you have infinite, finite, if infinite time extent, it might go down, but this is not only our experience. Very often, if you don't use operators of a meson meson type, you will not get um, the proper ground state energy in this case, somehow. Um, yeah, this is an inexperience, this of, of, often happens. Okay, maybe let me say in, in, in the past, people used just Q bar Q operators to study any resonance, right? And, um, Mm, I don't have a slide to show that, but okay, maybe this is, um, this is, um, sorry, this could be a slide to show that, uh, oh, here. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the experience of people who do that is that if you want to, to properly study a resonance, then you need to include two hadron operators with both two hadrons are projected to given momenta to really believe your eigenenergies. That would be my message. All right, thank you. Uh, okay, maybe what I wanted to say. In the past, people used Q bar Q operators to extract many eigenenergies, right? And they interpreted all these states as resonances. And in practice, all these states, um, there was no uh, sign of uh, two hadron states among those eigenstates that uh, people observed. Uh, I don't have a proper, um, yeah, maybe uh, next time I'll comment better on this when I'll have sl uh, some slide on that prepared. More questions? Yeah, it's getting late, I guess. Um, yeah, so, okay, maybe just for, uh, just to give you, a, since we didn't do resonances, yeah, you see, in the end, then people get nice resonance curves, which we'll do next time, um, and extract the resonance masses and bit, which we'll, we will, and then we'll go to couple channel resonances. Um, so, yeah.
but I, I thought uh, maybe it's better to do this part in more detail to, so that you can, can kind of follow what is being done in these simulations. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. Sasa, if uh, there is no question by the students, I have two curiosities. Sure. Uh, the first is, what is the dependence of the pion mass on your results? Uh, well, so uh, with pion mass, which are, uh, which is not feasible, let's say. I was showing uh, results for uh, various pion masses, of course, like, um, Okay, let me go through the results then. Um, okay, this is the ones I was showing here. It's almost physical. Yes, yes, yes. This yeah. Is yes. yeah. Okay, and you see this state that I was considering is then close to experiment. Okay, and then for example, uh, this um, Regensburg group did it for two pi masses, let me see. 150 MeV and 290 MeV. And the bound state, you can see it's 40 or 26 MeV below. I mean, do you, do you have a particular state in mind or what? No, I see. What, what I would like to ask is what is the dependence? The, the dependence so is uh, small. Ah. Actually, like I, 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 of course, it depends on what quantity you're asking for, right? Of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, of course. Uh, for example, um, here the binding energy does depend on the pion mass. That's why it's, if you want to get uh, the binding energy 42 MeV near the experiment, you, you better be really near the physical pion mass, the binding energy itself, okay, for this system. Of course, for the for the nucleon for the neutron system, of course, to to get two MeV, you you need to be near the physical pion mass. Mm -hmm. Okay, but let me give you since you're asking this, and thanks for the question. Let me go to the resonance, which I didn't study yet, but here you, you'll get some picture. Okay, a resonance can be parameterized in terms of a resonance mass and the coupling G, which gives you how well the resonance couples to the final state, to the two hadrons. And this is an example of raw resonance. This G is a coupling between a raw resonance and two pines. So, okay, let's hear many people studied raw, studied raw resonance, okay? And, and here you have results and there is a pion mass and the mass of a rho meson, resonance mass of a rho meson extracted. You see, of course, when the pion mass rises, the rho meson mass increases. Okay, so here there is a significant dependence on the pion mass. Yes. Let's look at the coupling. The coupling of a rho meson to two pions, that's the experimental number, it's six. And almost no, there is almost no dependence of this coupling. Um, of this coupling uh, with the pion mass. And that's kind of expected somehow. But let me note that um, the width is proportional to this coupling squared and the phase space. And the phase space depends very strongly on the pion mass. So the width strongly depends on the pion mass, but the coupling doesn't. So yeah, basically the raw resonance is one of the few cases where this pion mass dependence has been studied in detail for K-star resonance also, but maybe for neutron, but for other things that it was just done for some pion masses, not for the others. So a lot of things remain to be done. Most of things remain to be done. Yes, of course. More questions? Second curiosity is uh, uh, the, the dependence on the light space. Uh -huh. Of course, I know that all these calculations require huge computing yeah. resources. So, you see, so these <laughs> typically are not precision calculations. So the only resonance, and I will do it next time, that has been done by several collaborations was the raw meson resonance, by, by many collaborations. And there, it was also done on several lattice spacings. 
Um, and then, of course, they, I believe, it was done on several lattice spacings. And then you really extrapolate to lattice spacing zero and extract the result, I believe. But I'm not sure if for any other resonance or any other scattering channel, it was done for several lattice spacings and extrapolated. Um, so in, in most of the cases, this is not precision calculations like you, you would say a proton mass, uh, you know, it, was, yeah. it is done on many lattice spacing volumes. Uh, and so this is usually just calculations, almost always just one lattice spacing. So you have to bear this in mind. This is exploratory studies mostly, except for the Romanesan. Yeah, I see. But the more more interesting cases are, of course, much more difficult. Uh, like exotic hadrons are more m much more difficult than Romanesan. Right. More questions? Um, yeah. Can I ask something? I'm not sure this is um, well posed question. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, so on the lattice, one has to study a channel with a specific symmetry of this. I mean, a specific sorry. Um, representation of this other um, yeah ir yeah ir exactly one studies one irrep and another one yeah. and so on and how do we then match this thing to the to the I don't know like experimental result or to the continuum result mm -hmm. okay um, uh, let me try to answer. Yeah, for example, Hadron Spectrum studied all those EREPs. And from for each of those EREPs, they used this quantization condition. Um, quantization condition, which is this determinant. Um, yeah. Well, Maybe I should. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. okay. For each rep, one uses maybe I should say uh, this quantization condition. Okay. What this is? That's important. Maybe I didn't stress enough. This is the scattering amplitude in infinite volume. Now, this is not something finite volume. This is scattering amplitude in infinite volume. So from fra finite volume eigen energies in uh, finite volume eigen energies. Via Lusher equation, one extract scattering amplitude in infinite volume. Then, then it, you don't care about which irrep it is. It's just a, a partial wave L that is important. Okay. The problem is I don't know whether this was your question, but um, um, yeah, yeah, maybe this. This was confusing me, yes. Maybe uh, let me give you a, a little bit more, which I didn't manage to cover today, unfortunately, but you asked already. Uh, okay, for those who have another a minute or two. Okay, maybe you were uh, uh, wondering about this. If you're considering an rep where partial wave L equal to zero and L equal to one contribute. For moving frames, this often happens. Okay, then this is a two by two matrix. And this is such a matrix which is not diagonal, unfortunately. Okay, so maybe that's what you were referring. If you, you study a case, some irrep, a total momentum which is not equal to zero, and your scattering particles don't have the same mass, um, there can be such uh, such determinant equation, you can have contributions from zero and one mixed because this is non-zero here. Still, these are infinite volume scattering amplitudes, but they are difficult to extract from such an equation. And I will talk about that next time. I thought I will talk about that today, but I didn't manage. Maybe that's what you were referring to. Uh, but then we, so there is a match between some um, element of the scattering matrix in infinite volume and a certain number of contributions, each in one uh, irrep and one. Uh, yeah. Okay. All of okay. Them I don't know. Uh, maybe if people are. Yeah. I, let me uh, try to explain. But that's. But you see, 
But th that was kind of clear to you, okay? Okay, yes. the problem is now this equation, when you put a determinant, this equation is just one equation for two unknowns, scattering amplitude for L0 and L1. And you, you take one energy, and from one energy, you get one equation with two unknowns, right? That's what you were referring to, perhaps. That's a problem, right? From one, ener from one equation for one irrep, you cannot determine the two unknowns. And that is why, but as I said, that will be the topic of next time. That is why people do the following thing. People parameterize each scattering amplitude via some parameters. And then kind of use these kind of equations for all EREPs to determine these parameters all at the same time. It's, um, it's in this case, you don't get from one ener eigen energy the scattering amplitude at that energy. Okay, let me put it this way. It's not so simple. If you have two partial waves contributing from one eigen energy, you will not get a scattering amplitude at that energy. And let me postpone this to the next time uh, because maybe today uh, I, <laughs> it will not be. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. I mean, you were referring some, to something like that, probably. Yeah? Hopefully. Um, I, I'm not sure because I, I have not gone over the, the details of some of the things you said. So maybe if I'm still confused, I'll ask you again. Another yeah, time. okay, good.